Hi, I'm Hilary Acer, welcoming you to Raise the Line with Osmosis from Elsevier, an ongoing exploration about how to improve health education and healthcare. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Stephen Holm, who has the, the, the distinction of leading the launch of one of the nation's newest schools of osteopathic medicine, while also having been the leader of one of its oldest. Xavier University recently announced the selection of Dr. Holm as the founding dean of its proposed College of Osteopathic Medicine, which would be the nation's first Jesuit school of its type. Until he assumes that role in February, he will remain the dean of the Des Moines University College of Osteopathic Medicine, widely considered to be one of the strongest programs in the US. In fact, DMU's class of 2024 achieved the highest pass rate, pass rate among all osteopathic medical schools nationwide on level one of the complex national board exams. Dr. Helm joined DMU in 2019 after a 30 year career in clinical practice, medical education and academic leadership. He's also the founder of a leadership education program for medical students and residents and has served on numerous national committees supporting student medical education and research. Thanks so much for being with us today. Hillary, it's a, a, a pleasure and I'm very grateful to have a chance to talk with you. Likewise, Dr. Hom. So I'd like to start with learning a little bit more about what got you first interested in medicine and then in your case, internal medicine and pediatrics. Uh, well, it, it really started uh, in pediatrics for me. I was um, about 14 years old and I was on a mission trip uh, in Haiti. And I have since uh, been back to the Dominican Republic a couple of times and um, that area, uh, serving on mission trips. Um, but I was exposed at that time to uh, a number of pediatric patients. Um, and and it just kind of, I realized very, very quickly that that's the profession I wanted to pursue. Uh, during those years, I was a member of an Explorer's Post, uh, which is a, a form of uh, 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 co-educational, um, uh, exploring of careers um, for young men and young women. And our hospital sponsored the Explorer's Post. It was a medical Explorer's Post. So I had a, a, a great opportunities to spend some time in emergency rooms and in surgical suites. Uh, we were hypnotized by a psychiatrist and also exposed to pediatrics. And um, that was kind of just reinforced with me, my interest in going into pediatrics. That continued through medical school till my third year in medical school when I really enjoyed my adult cardiology and pulmonary medicine rotations. So I kind of opened up uh, a Pandora's box of wanting to go into both specialties. Um, so it was an evolution over time, but um, it really has been a great uh, adventure for me. Definitely sounds like you've had a pretty impactful career. I'm curious, Dr. Holm, why did you choose osteopathic medicine? Uh, Hillary, I'd say that it chose me as much as I chose it. Um, I was treated by an osteopathic physician when I was in college. Um, and uh, he uh, sat down and talked with me and uh, really got my, my interest peaked at uh, the small liberal arts college that I went to in Pennsylvania for undergraduate work, there was a pretty solid pathway to uh, uh, osteopathic medical school in Philadelphia, uh, Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine. That's kind of, I spent all my education years, including my residency in Pennsylvania. Um, so in Western PA for four years, Philadelphia for four years, and then uh, I enjoyed the smell of uh, chocolate every morning uh, living in Hershey, Pennsylvania, um, where I did my residency at Penn State University. We have quite a few fans of, of the uh, park there in Hershey, so I'm sure many of our team members would be, be happy to revisit that uh, alma mater with you and some of those old memories if you ever take a walk down memory lane. but. Um, now you're you're based obviously in in Iowa, and you've come a long way from that residency and and your medical education. Was being a leader always on your radar, or was that more of an unexpected path? Um, I interestingly, I, I I really think it's always been in some pretty uh, significant part of me. I mean, I, I think as a physician, 
uh, we all learn to lead our patients. Uh, we lead healthcare teams in everything that we do. But my study of leadership theory and uh, application started as a Boy Scout. Uh, leadership roles in scouting really opened up my interest. Uh, I had um, gained some confidence through the scouting program. And then right through medical school, college medical school, and as a chief of staff at a hospital system, I started leading medical education the last 10 years. Um, and it's just been a kind of a natural progression for me. Yeah, it sounds like it. And after serving in a couple of leadership roles myself, I know that there are multiple sides of being a leader can be wonderfully fulfilling, but it can also be quite challenging. So can you talk a little bit about the challenges and opportunities you face, and especially as you go from leading one of the oldest and largest schools of osteopathic medicine to a brand new program? Well, I, I think it's exciting um, to be able to become a founding dean in a new program. I get to create essentially uh, from a blank canvas, and I get to create based on my experiences in both healthcare and medical education, you know, what I think and the way I think uh, is the best way to learn. I've taught at four different medical schools. And uh, I think I look back and I, I see great things at each of those schools. And I see some challenging areas as well. And so my goal going forward is to kind of take a little bit of each of uh, those four medical schools and, and make a medical school that is even better, that, that is even more outstanding and innovative. I'm sure you'll bring all of those learnings to create something amazing. And, and I'm not sure if you can share, but can you preview any of the innovations you and, the, and Xavier University are hoping to bring to the new program? Well, with my simulation background, I'm a, a big believer in small group learning, uh, active learning, simulation medicine, experiential learning. So uh, that is very different than the traditional lecture and lab for two years and then clinical rotations for two years that I did when I was in medical school. My, one of my goals is uh, the first week of uh, medical school, of the new medical school at Xavier. My goal is to have students in a simulation lab, um, working with task trainers to learn and start to be introduced to learning procedures um, and interacting with standardized patients or actor patients, as we call them, in real scenarios of um, taking care of patients. So it's very exciting. That sounds incredibly exciting. And you mentioned, you know, our founder and CEO, Shiv Gaglani, who is um, now back in medical school, actually, but, you know, very uh, innovative and more visionary on how medical education could be changed and how we can integrate more of these evidence-based learning science techniques into the education. So I am excited to hear how all of that goes and Osmosis will definitely be rooting for you and supporting you along the way. Um, I noted the excellent results DMU students achieved on the COMLEX exams, and I'm curious what you attribute to that. I have to brag about my faculty. Um, I think my job is, is not to deliver the curriculum. The faculty delivers and is responsible for the curriculum. I empower my faculty. And so uh, it, it, I, I kind of work with them to uh, nurture them to make sure they're well prepared and that they're confident. The great thing is that I uh, am responsible for the outcomes. So if the board scores were the lowest in the nation, that, that's on me. But fortunately, DMU has always been uh, near the top. And this last year, we're number one in the nation for uh, complex level one and for the average numeric score for complex level two. So we've essentially hit a home run, and um, I, I think I attribute much of the success of the students to that faculty, uh, core faculty that teach them. We also offer students great resources in like osmosis. We have offered it to our second year class uh, in their preparation for their uh, first board evaluation. It really is uh, something the students enjoy. Uh, we've actually encouraged and have had our other programs, our PA program in particular, also use it and incorporate uh, the materials into, 
into their coursework. So it's a combination of great faculty and great resources. Well, congratulations to you and the team. I'm sure you've played a big role in that as well, and you should be very proud as the leader of that program to see such amazing results. Um, prior to coming to DMU, you were the chair of simulation medicine at Campbell University's School of Osteopathic Medicine. I'd love to get your perspective on the role simulation medicine plays in medical education today, and in particular, how it's changed over your career. I, I love that question, Hillary, because uh, simulation medicine changed my life about 10 years ago. It's kind of launched uh, a revolution in healthcare. Um, going way back, similarities to commercial aviation and healthcare have always been there. And in the 70s, 1970s, commercial aviation went through some big changes utilizing simulation techniques and debriefing, uh, teamwork, communications, improving things so that today commercial aviation is it's much safer to fly in an airplane than it is to go to a hospital. Um, so we have to take some of those uh, tricks and tips and uh, system improvements that you see in commercial aviation and bring them over to healthcare. And, and that's really the last probably 20 years what you've started to see in medical education. And it's just getting bigger and bigger more and more emphasis on experiential learning, uh, use of task trainers, mannequin-based simulation, and standardized patients. So um, I think it's a great opportunity to, to push uh, healthcare safety forward. I hadn't actually drawn the connection between aviation and medicine and medical education, but that makes a lot of sense. And hopefully we'll continue to draw from other industries and other fields and kind of cross-pollinate those best practices and ideas within creating high-performing teams, creating cultures where you know people can speak up if there are mistakes made. And of course, for our students, make sure that they get plenty of, of repetitions and, and time to practice before they actually see their real patients. So yeah, we're excited to uh, continue partnering, especially across Elsevier with other tools and expanding our um, resources around simulations and that kind of education. Hillary, there, there is a great book that okay. uh, compares uh, the successes uh, in commercial aviation to the potential successes in hospitals and healthcare. It's called Why Hospitals Should Fly. And the idea is that hospitals need to have that level of safety that commercial aviation has established. It's by uh, the author is uh, John Nance, and John is a national leader in um, uh, improving healthcare uh, outcomes and healthcare quality. So I'd recommend that's an easy read. I think listeners will uh, be able to apply what I'm saying in recognizing how important this is. Thanks for sharing that. And we'll definitely include that in the show notes. Um, one side note. Um, so Shiv, actually, our CEO, was a, a pilot or is a pilot. And early on in Osmosis, he actually had created a website, Osmosis Aviation. I'm not sure if it's still around, but I think his hope was to teach people how to learn medicine and how to learn aviation at the same time. So I, I'm curious. I'll have to go back and ask him if he knows about this book or if, if he's ever heard of it, because maybe that's where Osmosis was inspired from. Who knows? So that's a great story. I'm actually a private pilot as well. You I are. was instrument rated. I haven't flown in a long time. But uh, right before I left practice, I spent about 10 years doing uh, FAA uh, medical examinations on pilots. So they had to be cleared by me um, as a, a, a senior aviation medical examiner. Uh, on a regular basis in order to uh, be safe in the air. So that was a that was a fun um, and enjoyable part of my career. Wow, I didn't realize that. That's that's yep. really neat. Yeah, and you, you and Shiv will definitely have to connect on, on that soon. Um, switching gears just a little bit, I want to talk about the medical leadership education program that you started. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? What is the program? What is your goal? And, and how is it performing today? I started that program actually 11 years ago when I started in medical education and left my private practice. It's called Professionalism and Leadership in the Medical Setting, or PALMS. 
P-A-L-M-S. And it's a formal program curriculum. There's an online portion of it. Um, we do eight hours live with small groups, uh, with students. And the whole idea is uh, I, I was able to apply leadership principles by a national leadership coach and author. His name is Jim Anderson. Jim and I worked together with a couple of students uh, to create this curriculum. What I brought to his principles of leadership are all of the healthcare experiences I've had in dealing with patients, dealing with other physicians, medical staff, professionals, hospital administrators, um, and medical education leaders. It's really a great program, and I've I, I've done it every year. I've been in the last eleven years at probably over fifteen hundred students that have completed the program, and I have a, a new group starting in January here at DMU that will do it again. That's great. And is this program something that is open to all students or DMU students in particular? I've only been able to do it with my DMU students. Um, I've uh, gone back to previous medical schools and given some legacy programs. But uh, currently, I, I, I hope to grow it and do some national uh, presentations. Yeah, I'm sure many students would be very excited to get involved in a program like that. We at Osmosis actually have been running for about five years now a professional development program called the Osmosis Medical Education Fellowship. Uh, now we're actually changing it to the Osmosis Health Leadership Initiative to expand across other health professions as well. So not just medical doctors, but now we're, we're serving nurses and PAs and dentists and all health professions. And it's been one of the most fulfilling parts of my time at Osmosis is actually seeing our students learn and grow and develop these skills and go out into their schools or into their clinical settings and, and take what they've learned from these programs. So I'd love to stay in touch with you about that in case there's any learnings we can share. That's super. You know, today healthcare is so interdisciplinary disciplinary and interprofessional. Uh, I've done the program um, with podiatry students, with PA students, uh, physical therapy students, as well as MD and DO students. I've done it with residents as well um, after they're done in medical school. Um, so um, it, it, it's, uh, it's exciting to, uh, to share some thoughts and perspective that I have uh, at this point in my career with young students and uh, young doctors. Yeah, I'm sure. And on this topic of, of leadership skill development, you know, there's so much to get through in a medical education, you know, three or four years of school plus residencies or fellowships, you know, they're really strapped for time. Um, but one of the things that we love about osmosis is that we have you know short videos that we can share with students. We can work with faculty or, or deans or programs like yours and and really try to supplement the learning so that maybe what would normally take an hour to educate somebody will, will take a short, you know, seven minute video or something like that. Um, but I'd love to know also, you know, are there topics that you think osmosis should make videos on or courses about or maybe gaps in our knowledge that you're particularly passionate about? I love and I just learned from from what you just said uh, about the leadership uh, opportunity uh, and course. I think that's tremendous. I think uh, systems based practice improvement, quality improvement. Um, I think uh, another piece is financial security for for young students and young physicians. Areas that are sometimes overlooked uh, by medical schools. I, I've brought my leadership program to. Uh, three different medical schools, and it's uh, in the curriculum for, for two of those three. Absolutely love the thought of collaborating in some way uh, to just grow this process. Likewise, we'll, we'll definitely be in, in touch about that. And I guess on our last question here, uh, I'd love to know, you know if you have any general advice to our healthcare students about meeting the challenges of, of this moment or the challenges that we foresee in healthcare around the corner. Yeah, I think um, it, it's important, whatever level, if you're trying to get into medical school, if you are trying to get the best residency, uh, trying to get the best job after becoming an attending physician, um, it's really important that you stand out in some positive way. Uh, make yourself uh, special with some kind of skill or talent or expertise uh, and always be kind and compassionate. Do not ever underestimate 
the role that compassion has for your career in healthcare. What a, a beautiful way to close up our conversation, Dr. Hom. It is very aligned with the osmosis value of start with the heart and something that we try to teach our learners as they go through our programs and also something that we make sure our team embodies. Is there anything else you'd like to cover today with our audience? Uh, I think you've asked some great questions and I just appreciate your time and um, your, your audience's time. So uh, thank you. Well, thank you so much for being with us today, Dr. Hom. It was a pleasure learning about your journey, and we're very excited to see how Xavier University opens with your leadership and would love to stay in touch. Uh, with that, I'm Hillary Acer. Thanks for checking out today's show. Remember to do your part to raise the line and strengthen the healthcare system. We're all in this together. If you like this podcast, please share it on your social channels. You can also subscribe to the series and check out all of our episodes at osmosis.org slash raise the line podcast.